The human mind can take trauma of the worst kind and find deep meaning in it. And for me, it was that period. And coming out of it, I am a different human being. You know, I feel more open to the world, more loving, more interested in mysteries than answers. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Dr. Docker Keltner on the show. Dr. Keltner is one of the world's foremost emotion scientists. He's a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley and the director of the Greater Good Science Center. Fun fact, he was the scientific advisor behind the beloved Pixar movie Inside Out. He has over 200 scientific publications and six books, including Born to be Good, The Compassionate Instinct, and The Power Paradox. His latest book, which is the subject of our conversation today, is called Awe, The New Science of Everyday Wonder and How It Can Transform Your Life. In this episode, I talked to Docker about the new science of awe. Emotions like fear and disgust have been extensively researched because of their roles in human survival. But Dr. Keltner argues that awe is also essential for well-being and community. Music, art, and nature are some of the antecedents that can induce a sense of wonder, inspiring us to be better by recognizing that we're parts of a greater whole. We also touch on the topics of transcendence, neuroscience, evolutionary psychology, and creativity. It's always great fun chatting with Docker. I really respect his work so much. And every time I talk to him, I just feel so much joy. He's one of the world's leading experts on the science of happiness and awe. And it's been an honor for me to publish some work with him on this topic, but also it was an honor to have this conversation with him and get the chance to discuss his new book is awesome. All right, so without further ado, I bring you Dr. Docker Keltner. Docker, so great to have you on the Psychology Podcast again after all these years. I know. It's good to be with you, Scott, and to have a conversation about transcendence. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'm sure we've both grown a lot since our last chat on this show, yeah. uh, six, seven years ago or so. My gosh, yeah. time, time flies. I love this topic. A huge congrats on the publication of your new book. I know you've been working on this research for at least 15 years. Um, take me back to the beginning of this research where you're like, you know what, I'm going to try to scientifically tackle a topic that perhaps to a lot of other psychologists may have seemed out of reach from measurement. Yeah, the I think there were, um, thanks for asking that question. That is the, the big question. You know, John Hyde and I wrote a paper on all, I think 2001 or 2003, and it took a while to get the science going. And I think there, there were a couple of problems. And thanks for asking the scientific question. You know, one was like, how do you get people to feel it, you know, in, in a lab, you know, which often looks like a little impoverished office? You know, we struggled with that and fail, early failures. And then the second question is really your question, which is measurement. You know, how do you, if this is an ineffable emotion with mystery at the heart of it, people claim like William James, it's beyond words. A lot of people have felt mm -hmm. that. What do we do? And, you know, I have to say, I mean, one of the most exciting things about writing the book, Scott, is like, you can now uh, measure awe with a lot of richness, you know, with words like awe, wonder, amazement, with vocalizations, whoa, with facial behavior, uh, with goosebumps. There's really nice work on the chills now by yeah. Todd Thrash, even with physiology, you know, default mode network. So ironically, and this kind of struck me at the end of the book, you know, thinking about this, the measurement issue. You know, I've taught emotion for 25, 30 years, and awe may be one of the more coherent emotions to measure. You know, it's, we can get it. So, mm. so I think that's why the awe science uh, has really grown pretty prolifically recently is people have realized like, wow, this mysterious emotion, you can measure it, you can find it in different life contexts and in, with laboratory, laboratory paradigms. So it's been exciting to see. It's definitely been exciting to see. And and to be a part of somewhat, we have a, we have a co-authored paper on the measure yeah. on the measurement of all the all scale. <laughs> with that, that is <laughs> the key scale in the whole field. That's right. With David Yates. Transformative. <laughs> <laughs> I, love that, I love that you said that. <laughs> Better you saying that than me saying that. Um, uh, yeah, it is very exciting, and uh, I'm trying to think of where where all should be placed within the whole emotions um framework yeah. 
because yeah. I've never really liked the distinction between positive and negative emotions. It Me seems neither. so judgy. <laughs> it is. I agree. And 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 I wouldn't even. I don't think all is like it perfectly fits within either. Like you know, it yeah. seems like a hybrid model. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is. It's well. It's a, a complicated mixture of, yeah. of you know has a bit of fear in it sometimes yeah. horror sometimes terror but awe the feeling of vast mystery. Yeah, I, you know, your question, and thank you for asking it of all the interviews <laughs> I've done on awe in the past six weeks. No one has asked that question. And yet it's the question that's defined yeah. uh, a lot of our work. So, well, you know, I'm a where nerd. Is <laughs> you know, I'm a nerd. I know. And, 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 you know, there are some embedded questions here, like how different is awe from fear, yeah. right? The etymology of the word awe traces back to eighth and ninth century fear and dread. Is that really true today? How is awe different from beauty? Like when you just are blown away or just moved by a landscape painting. Uh, and so I, I would encourage our audience to uh, c- go to alancowan.com. And Alan is this brilliant computational uh, scientist. And he and I have done like eight to 10 large scale studies where people rate their emotional responses to thousands of stimuli, mm. gifts, pieces of music paintings, vocalizations, samples of prosody, facial expressions, photographs. And what you find with the really cool statistical techniques that he's figured out is there are about 20 emotions in this complicated space. There's a good deal of cross-cultural overlap. And awe is very much in your sweet spot, Scott, which is it's in these self-transcendent emotions of emotions that take you away from the self. Like, deep love and admiration and absorption into a stimulus and beauty, but all has its own distinct state with its own subjective qualia, if you look, feeling. And importantly, in almost every way that we study awe, from self-report to facial expression to vocalization, it's really different from fear. You know, fear is like, Wah! you know, and awe sounds different. Whoa. Yeah. It has a different physiological profile. So that work, You know, part of the question is, you know, is is awe just a kind of part of fear or a version of love? And no, it's its own thing. And I, you know, Descartes, Einstein, others were like, this feeling of mystery is foundational to to the mind. And I think those data attest to that. Oh, yeah, I do. I do think so as well. But uh, just thinking about like, okay, if that's our new classification scheme, self-transcendent emotions, and then, yeah. th- then that changes the whole classification schemes. Then you have, then you have non-trans self-transcendent emotions. So I'm trying to think, through, like, is happiness a non-self-transcendent emotion? I'm trying to think, and then I was trying to think in my head, well, which ones really are clearly non-self-transcendent emotions? Shame. Well, I don't know. Definitely. Maybe, what, what, would you say shame is a non-self-transcendent emotion? Yeah, you know, emotion? And, yeah. and you're rightly calling into question these groupings, and they always encounter mm-hmm. problems. But self-transcendent states, you know, you know them well, you know, Scott, like, Awe, bliss, joy, um, gratitude, gratitude, compassion, mm. inspiration, inspiration. I actually, and I love certain forms of humor, like the sense of the absurd. Mm. Like, yeah, yeah, my life's absurd. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, and then there's self-conscious emotions, yeah. shame, embarrassment, guilt, pride. I think there are attachment-related emotions, love, desire, you know, the filial love, sympathy. Uh, and then you get into the fight or flight negative emotion. So yeah, uh, you could question it, but it does pose this interesting question of, you know, that we have to grapple with, like, what are the kind of the cognitive appraisal processes that produce states like bliss, joy, awe. And, and I think self-transcendence is part of the story. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I, and I, I do like co- putting it with the grouping of you self-transcendent emotion. What do you think the problems yeah. are of that, that category? No, I, 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 I like that category and I, I okay. don't see problems with it. Um, but it just made me think, well, that means then there are non self transcendent emotions. That's the only yeah. thing that like kind yeah. of like tripped me up for a second. Cause I was like, yeah. Hmm, what would, what would that, what would a truly non self transcendent emotion look like? Cause we're such a social species, right? Yeah, no, so I like know. even things like, you know, shame seems to me like it's partly influenced, of course, by others' evaluations of us. So, but it's but it is still focused so much on the self. So th- right. that is true. That is true. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Nice uh, question. 
<laughs> yeah, well, thank you. So what have you found are some of the biggest triggers of all? Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, we did a bunch of work defining awe. It's vast, mis- you know, it's when we encounter kind of vast stimuli or really beyond your typical frame of reference or scale of perception that are hard to understand or colloquially, mm-hmm. might, we might say, mysterious. And then we did a bunch of work on triggers of, of awe. And one kind of study that I write about in the book is in the spirit of William James, we got these stories of awe from 26 countries uh, at, as diverse as Mexico and India, you know, Poland, Germany, U.S., Canada, Japan, et cetera. And then the others, we did daily diary studies where, you know, we would ask people in different countries every night, tell us if you felt some awe during the day. And both of those data converge on the idea, and it really caught us off guard that it's really, you know, what we called moral beauty that triggers awe. Um, Amazing. You know, people's kindness, uh, their their overcoming of obstacles, their courage, and standing up to the abuse of power. Um, and and that caught it, that was surprising, you know, that it is. Yeah, nature is common as a source of awe, spirituality, but man, just the wonders of people, their ordinary goodness really moves us to awe. I love it. And and you briefly just passed by, but you mentioned default mode network. <laughs> you yeah. said that. You, now, that's my, that happens to be like my favorite brain network that I, that I study in the context of creative, creativity and creative thinking uh-huh. um, and, and educational neuroscience and um, work I've done with Mary Helen and Merdino Yang. Um, <clears throat> and she, she has shown in her own research independent of me that, that default mode network is active when we are witnessing examples of moral elevation, but not examples of like visual spatial rotation or like wow. non human, right. uh, processing. Cool. There's something very unique about watching inspiring examples of our fellow humans that activates this brain network uh whereas the you know the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is like the robotic part of our brain in a way or, yeah <laughs> i'll have you to track I mean? that down yeah yeah i think that that ties in really nicely with the, with the all like experience i mean what's your read of the literature i mean obviously no single brain network is gonna explain everything uh what have you found is the whole terrain of the neuroscience of of all and uh physiology of all where are we at with that I, I think we've made really interesting progress, but, you know, so, uh, but man, are there big mysteries, right? So the, there's work, um, and I can't remember the specifics of Helen, I mean, or, you know, Yang studies, but from Japan and Holland showing awe tends to diminish default mode network activation, sort of the quieting of the self. That's a pretty robust finding in psychedelics uh, that Michael Pollan reported upon. And that others have have replicated, um, but the the big mystery to me, and and this is why awe is really interesting for emotion neuroscience is, it is yeah okay the self gets quiet, but awe has all these fascinating subjective qualities to it of feeling believing in human beings and wanting to serve and your mind is really creative. So I bet you have some hypotheses. Yeah, because my, what I was saying was the exact opposite of yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, and what, and what I'm saying, yeah. Well, you yeah, know, I'm awe saying, has yeah. these different sti- these different. Sometimes people study it with in response to nature or other people's goodness mm. or memories of mm. experiences. So there's going to be inconsistencies. You know, that's it. Yeah, that's the key. <laughs> that's yeah. the key to this mystery. It is. is right? uh, yeah, it's like it's almost like no surprise that like default mode is active when you're social processing but right. when it's in nature obviously you know it, other things are going to come online and be yeah no that that's 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 the key to this mystery is uh yeah uh, that all kind of transcends um uh, any particular brain network <laughs> yeah but i think that you know when i look at the subjective qualities of awe like really feeling like you've encountered what's meaningful to you feeling a sense of communal interconnectivity uh having mm. a sense that you're part of something really vast, you know, uh, like yeah. those are uncharted territories in large part in this, this realm of the self-transcendent brain. And I think you and David Yaden and Helen Imordino Imor- Yang and others are going to get to there. 
the, those answers. And they're fascinating questions, right? About why did we evolve this emotion? There's a lot of good work on the chills and awe, mm. certain kinds of chills that accompany awe, the goose tingles. Um, yeah. And then, you know, yeah. our, our works, our lab's done a bit on vagal tone. Um, awe elevates vagal tone. So we're getting there. And it, and it poses really interesting questions about the emotional body and brain. Wait, wait, wait. Does all uh, activate vagal tone or does vagal tone activate all? Well, everything goes in every direction. Yeah. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. That's so, the right answer. Or option C. Um, <laughs> you know, the reason why I ask, it's like, I could see, you know, be, watching something all like could actually activate the calm and connect system as like, I know Barbara Fredrickson, Fredrickson calls it that, the calm and connect system. Um, and you could certainly see that being the case. I also think it, it can be the case, right? That where you have activated the calm and connect system in some other way. And that like unlocks your potential for all. Does that make sense? <laughs> oh my God. Is that a profound need uh, in our empirical study of all, you know, we get so, mm. <clears throat> we get so locked in, in the emotion world of gratitude and compassion and awe and amusement mm. and pride and shame, treating those emotions as the independent variable, right? Like mm. all does this. And, and there, that's, all of the studies of all, all makes you creative. It makes you less polarized. It, it reduces stress. But what about the other direction, right? Mm. What about, what is the, you know, does um, certain kinds of meditation, do certain kinds of meditation make you more yeah. prone to awe? Do, you know, visits to the woods make you more prone to awe? And so does a high vagal tone profile make you more open to awe? We don't know. And those are yeah. key, key questions. Yeah, key questions. Young researchers uh, out there, go get it. Yeah, uh, you're, I hope you're, are you referring to me? Am I young? Yes. <laughs> um, the back creaks <laughs> these days, but, <laughs> but I'll take it. Okay, well, what do you see as the main features of all? I mean, this could have been one of my first questions, but yeah. it'd be better late than never. Yeah. You know, what, what do you see as some of the essential features? Yeah, that, that's a terrific question. That took a, a lot of work, and and I drew upon a couple of different sources in writing awe, right? The first was the empirical science, and I'll just briefly touch upon that, lab studies. But the second was the long-standing narrative traditions of expressive writing about awe, spiritual writing, nature writing like Emerson and Margaret Fuller, psychedelic writing, you know, near-death mm -hmm. experience writing. Lots of people really write a lot about awe. And, mm -hmm. and you can start to find this essential structure to it or features, like you say, you encounter vast mysteries, you feel this sense of awe, and then it really makes the self small and quiet and humble. Mm -hmm. It opens your mind, you know, people in a state of awe open up into wonder, like, wow, how in the world do clouds produce lightning, you know, or mm -hmm. how could that skateboarder skate on that railing? So you're like, whoa, so you're open and you're searching for ideas. And then what William James called saintly tendencies that, you know, that it is fascinating. These big experiences of awe kind of make you want to be good for other people, you know, that you come out of it like, whatever I make of that, I just want to be good. You know, I want to be a kind neighbor or good, you know, friend. So that is, those are sort of the essential features. And then, you know, we, we it's interesting, Scott. You know, I've taught awe for 10 years and, and people will come to me and they'll say, I'm not sure I've had an experience of awe, you know, and I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. tell, tell me like, when did you see something vast and mysterious? Well, you know, I was, you know, riding in my friend's plane and I accidentally fell out <laughs> and I've landed in a haste. It was amazing. And I'm like, okay, did you feel quiet? Did you kind of tear up at the event? Did you feel some goosebumps? You know, so we. Mm. We know these subjective qualities to awe as well. So that's sort of a, a catalog of the essential features of awe. Yeah, this is this is on brand for you, sir. You know, you, uh, you've you spent a lot of your career trying to focus on the good um, and uh, making the case that we're wired for good yeah. as a species. And it makes you uh, a very unique uh, figure, not within the positive psychology movement, but yeah. within the evolutionary psychology I know. movement. Yeah. That puts you quite in interesting because you could have easily, when you started studying the evolutionary psychologists, like just gravitate towards, 
you know, like aggression, yeah. uh, meeting, uh, poaching, um, yeah. <laughs> dark stalking, you know, David Buss stuff that he loves that shit. But, um, but you, you, you carve your own unique pathway Yeah. again within evolutionary psychology, obviously you did within positive psychology, but that's obvious, but within evolutionary, I just want to call that out. There's not, um, a lot of people focusing on that. Um, I do want to give a shout out to my colleague, Glenn Gear who recently published the book Positive Evolutionary Psychology, cool. um, which I wrote the foreword to. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but, I have to take um, uh, uh, but yeah, where he attempted to try to reorient the, the field of evolutionary psychology in that direction. But you've been, you know, doing that for ages. So this is, this is in, in another way, this is um, carrying on from that yeah. tradition, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, thank you for making that observation. And I hadn't really thought about that, but you know, um, I was captivated by an evolutionary approach to the human psyche and social behavior. Mm. And it is true, like the, the prevailing evolutionary science that really took hold on jealousy and mate selection and, you know, uh, violence in families, step violence, et cetera, all the big headline findings, rape, really fit this kind of bloody and tooth and claw view of human nature. And that frustrated me, um, you know, uh, and, and I remember hearing Franz Duval say this, offer this really interesting observation. He was a big inspiration for me. Uh, you know, that book, Good Natured, where he's like, hey, chimps have been, have been wired by evolution to feel guilt and empathy and, you know, they cooperate and assist others. And he said, you know, it's interesting, American evolutionists looked at a group of non-human primates and all they wrote about was competition and violence japanese evolutionary scientists looked at this roughly the same group of non-human primates and they looked they discerned and looked observed all this cooperation Hmm. and so i have really took taken a more of a pro-social lens like look at all the cooperation in that emerges early the sharing uh that people like david rand have documented the uh, capacity, the compassion in particular, you know, that work showing we have evolved to take care of harm in others. And those yeah. started to be portals into a broader view of, wow, we are this social species. We do a lot of horrible things in the name of our social sociality, but we do a lot of good um, that's worth profiling. Yeah. I mean, technically we evolved. I mean, you know this obviously, but we we evolved for survival or reproduction. And evolution doesn't particularly care about our happiness yeah, or our yeah. long-term well-being of the organism. Anything that propagates uh, the genes is a win. <laughs> Thumbs up. Yeah. <laughs> but so one, based on that, I mean, I believe some evolutionary psychologists infer infer from that um, some a lot of things that they tend to get us very cynical about the true motives of humans because you could say like, well, what looks like altruism. Yeah. It, or night, you know, yeah, okay, yeah, guys are nice, but look, let's be honest, they're really nice to get laid. Right. I feel like you're kind of this like pure, like joyful human <laughs> in this field who's like not cynical. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. How, do you know what I mean, though? <laughs> and it aggravates some people, and I can't help it. You know. Yeah. You I know. love it. I love you, man. <laughs> I love that about you. Yeah. Well, you know, I. Uh, and I, I actually think, you know, I, I didn't do the work that really I was, I, I was probably on the, the outside or kind of, of, um, the various empirical findings that, uh, now supported a much more favorable view of human nature. You know, mm. and I'm thinking about just Joseph Henrik, the default tendency to mm. share resources, David mm. Rand, intuitive sharing, although that's a controversial finding. You know, some of the work on Tomasello on the early emergence uh, in humans of assistance and providing help, you know, and then you you build that into the nervous system, right? That these are all processes enabled by vagal tone and oxytocin and the like. And that just feels robust to me that, you know, that there is this deeply pro-social tendency to humans and so much so. I hear uh, Richard Dawkins said he would um, rename his book The Cooperative Gene, knowing no way. Yeah, knowing what he knows about the wow. evolution of cooperation now from the selfish gene. Wow. So, yeah, wow. you know, and then the debates about motives, like 
all right, I share all my resources, I give you everything. You know, am I really secretly trying to be more attractive to other romantic partners? Who knows? You know, what I care about, as Dan Batson really convincingly argued, and Franz Duvall, is the proximal mm. determinants of behavior, you know, and, and there's a lot yeah. of goodness in there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I like you. I like that. I like that a lot. You, you know, you personally have been through things and, uh, you, you know, thanks for your vulnerability in your book, you know, writing about it. Your brother, Rolf, uh, I believe, passed away from cancer. Yeah. And that really changed your understanding of all. And, and if I'm right, it motivated you to write this book. Is that right? Yeah. Thanks for asking. Got, you know, I was, uh, you know, moving along with the awe science. I felt like I was four or five years away from really starting to put it into a book. Uh, and then my brother, Rolf, and he and I, he's one year younger. We had kind of an experimental childhood. You know, we were born in Mexico, counterculture parents, lived in the late 60s in Laurel Canyon, kind of this wild place and had a wild upbringing you know, eventually moved to the mm. country and swam in rivers and, and we did everything together and he got colon cancer and, uh, colon cancer is horrifying. It's really mm. one of the bad ones. You know, it is just like, yeah, yeah. it is combat, you know, and the, it just crushes the body. And that was brutal. That was two years of, um, total brutality of, you know, just chemo and stomach surgeries and so forth and and really horrifying and then on the night he took a cocktail to end his life um we were all there and and i was like you know really activated i had no idea what it all meant uh i was in a really like we all were just intense state and when i saw him you know as he was drifting into his the afterlife, wherever he goes, you know, he was calm and, um, you know, he, he looked different facially. He was smiling. His breathing really responded to us. We would say things and his breathing would slow down. And the amazing thing, Scott, I don't know if this has ever happened to you because you study transcendence, you know, from a scientific academic perspective is I started to it was this profoundly reverential moment where we were all sitting around him, touching him. And I started to almost hallucinate where, you know, like I started, the light around him was really vibrating and pulsating. And I, I really felt like there was a soul in him that was moving into that space. Mm. And then we were there and like often in cases like this, he waited to die until we were all gone. Um, and it it was a transcendent experience of awe to watch him die. And it is a universal human experience of awe to watch people you love go. It can be horrifying and terrifying and as well. And then what happened to me, to your latter part of your question, is I was blown off the map. You know, I'm like, I was not sleeping and really heated in my inflammation system and confused and hallucinating and you know, Joan Didion writes about awe, the awe of grief, almost like a, a, or the grief is like a psychotic state. And I felt like that. I really was like, mm. man, I could barely make sense of things. And I just decided, you know, uh, I got to go find awe, you know, because I felt totally out of touch with what brought me awe in life. Yeah. And, and that led to the book. And my, my first part of the book writing was, yeah, I, I grabbed a bunch of books that meant a lot to me. I just started writing about awe and my brother, you know, and just like where we found it as kids and what it meant to us. And, you know, and and it started to take shape. And then the voice that I really heard mm -hmm. that I think is important for our day coming out of the pandemic and all the depression out there and our kids is like, find awe, man. Like, mm -hmm. get, you know. Uh, I don't know if you know Yumi Kendall. You probably do from the... Of course, yeah. yes. Yeah. I mean, you... She's the same chair in the Philadelphia Orchestra that my grandfather had in the Philadelphia Orchestra. 50 Are you years. serious? Yes, they're the same chair. Third oh my chair, God. Third cellist, yeah. We, yeah, I mean, maybe promoted. because of yeah. you, Scott, but she we calls still, me up yeah. and she's like, I'm all about awe. You know, music is awe. Mm. So I went and I heard her play and had this transformative experience of music. So, yeah, it it 
And I think the lesson there, and I know you've thought a lot about this, is like the human mind can take trauma of the worst kind and find deep meaning in it. And for me, it was that period. And coming out of it, I am a different human being. You know, I feel more open to the world, more loving, more interested in mysteries than answers. So it was a, oh, a life that, that gave me goosebumps. Oh. More <laughs> mysteries than answers. I'm writing that down. Um, no, that just gave me goosebumps. <sighs> yeah, I mean, music for me, um, for me, cello music is is so self transcendent. When I listen to Yo Yo Ma play, um, there there's there are particular pieces uh, that um, I could share with you that just bring me such a sense of awe. What does it and, do for uh, you? Like, how does it wash over you, or what does it act bring to your mind? There's something so transcendent, timeless about. Um, some of this music, you know, there's no words. It's not like there's a, uh, it's giving you any sort of ideology. <laughs> yeah. You, there's something that just, you listen, I, I feel a bitter sweetness yeah. um, to some of this. I find uh, particularly uh, the key of E minor. Really? Uh, the most self-transcendent key. I'm going to look into yes. that. Why do you think that is? Oh, yeah. That's really curious. It's the most bittersweet key. Yeah. Um, it's like so close to E, which is bright, but it's not. It's yeah. E minor. Hmm. It, it, e major, you know, so bright, but no, it's E minor. I don't know. It's uh, or you know, C is so bright, bright. You know, C C feels happiness, not transcend, self transcendent. I don't know. There's something about E minor. Um, it's uh, there's just like a uh, a real reflection from above that state that it puts me in, as opposed to uh, feeling from within. It's just kind of yeah. like a more above reflection Isn't that, that amazing? is emotional too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, and that's one of the mysteries in this book is like you can people feel a lot of awe in response to music and they cry mm. and get teary, they get goosebumps, they hug, they feel transformed, as I did listening to this piece by John Adams. But how sounds do that, like you're providing a hypothesis about E minor, blows my mind that a pattern of sound can make you feel like things above connect to you. That's amazing. Mm. I hope I hope science gets there. I hope so too. It is absolutely amazing. Um, and well, you talk about other domains in this book. We already talked, hint, hinted a little bit about nature. Yeah. Um, what does the research show about nature? It's you know, it. I mean, you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson. You know, he he was a naturalist in the sense of mm. finding awe in the divine in nature. Forty percent of Americans feel nature is animated by a transcendent spirit. Um, mm. I kind of feel that way when I go backpacking and, and the research on this is just astonishing. And it is one of the real success stories of all research thus far. A lot of it coming out of South Korea, Japan, where they really are interested in forest bathing and rituals in nature as a healthcare solution. And, you know, I, I mean, the, when you, people go out in nature and they just start having this different kind of awe experience of like, God, I feel like I'm I'm naked in the woods and boundaries are dissolving and the sounds are all and the light is so bright and and the studies are finding, you know, the sounds of water activate parts of your nervous system that are related to awe. Yeah. You know, there are certain chemicals in nature that open up your mind to temporal vastness and memory, that the imagery itself, obviously, the sense of interconnectivity. And you know, uh there's a ton of data nicely reviewed by Ming Kuo uh, in, I think, 2016 or 2015. And it's, it's just, it's hard to beat in terms of lifting us <laughs> hard up. To beat. It is, you know. So, you know, yeah, it, yeah. It, and it does it through calming our attention and awe and just the physical soothing on your body, you know, probably the influence on the microbiome. So it's incredible. And, and really, you know, it's interesting, Scott, 30 years ago, like, mm. oh, it would feel sort of corny to study nature and emotion. And mm. today it's a massively important field, you know, with a lot of real world rel relevance. So it's, it's, a, it's good, good wow. news. I love that. It keeps coming back to like connection. Yeah. Um, when you're in nature, when you feel connected to nature, does that, does that make you tend to be more connected to if you're fellow humans as yeah. well? Or do those things go together? They, well, what we do know, 
And this is a, uh, you're, <laughs> you're asking such key <laughs> questions, which is, you know, I was we, always in trouble in school for <laughs> no. asking this. Teachers are like, Scott, you're asking yeah. too many. Yeah. I'm trying to teach for a multiple choice here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one of the really surprising findings that you were the first to bring up is this, which is you can produce awe in the lab by having people look at, you know, film from BBC Earth or really cool images of the northern lights and you feel awe. And then our studies show. Even though it's nature, that awe makes you feel more connected to your fellow human beings. You know, in one of our studies, we had individuals draw a social network with little circles that are individuals and then connect all the circles. And in when you feel awe, you have a richer social community oh, produced wow. by nature. And, and that tells us, it, it wow. raises this fascinating question of like, how in the world could I go to Yosemite and look at a giant wall of rock? And come out of it feeling like, I love my fellow human beings. Mm. It's kind of mysterious, right? And I think the what awe does is it shifts us out of this sense of self as separate from others to a sense of self as interconnected, no matter what the source. And and we need more work on that. We do, but uh, the work that has already been done on it, as you mentioned, is, is so groundbreaking and important. Do you think that there's an awe deprivation going on in the lives of children today? with a cutting of music classes, uh, art yeah. classes. Do, do, you, do you see a problem here? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, you know, I, um, I was really lucky, Scott. You know, I, I was raised by these mm -hmm. counterculture parents. And they just, like, let my brother and I find all, you know, nature mm -hmm. and museums and the things that we were curious about. You know, I love dinosaurs and my brother loved magic tricks, you know. And so mm -hmm. we just went our ways and developed this sense of awe. And then, you know, in raising my two daughters, Natalie and Serafina, 25 and 23, they did great in school and they're, they're wonderful human beings. But when I looked at what a young person does uh, in many parts of the globalized world, in school, you know, schools oriented, you know, like you said, like the humanities have less of a role, art has less of a role, music less of a role, oriented toward code and certain kinds of math, et cetera, which is great. But, um, and then more importantly, like, what do you do after school? Well, you're scheduled out of your mind and you, you're doing, you know, hip hop dance class. And then the, you know, the, the Spanish class and, and you get home at seven and then you do your homework and there was no awe. I, you know, my kids, my daughters who are both fierce and love awe had to like force awe into their lives through, you know, going to wild dances and traveling by themselves in South America and, and, you know, living on farms and, and we had take the, our culture's taken it largely away from them, you know, as have the digital That's technologies. Sad. Yeah. So it's, but we're designing awe curricula at the greater good science center. Uh, and I think there's an awe movement and education coming that will correct some of these, these problems. These are some heavy themes today. <laughs> I can't the help. Themes of, well, you know, there's two ends of this. There's death and then there's life. Now, yeah. we found in our own paper that we published that one of the biggest triggers of all on our six-factor all scale was the other category. And the biggest thing in the all category was childbirth. Yeah, yeah. That's the other cycle. That's the other end. It is. You know what I'm saying? It is. And, you know, anyone mm. who's watched or had a child, most people feel awe. You know, and I think that there's this deeper lesson there. Like I, I've thought about, you know, when spring arrives, we often feel awe. We're just electrified <laughs> by the emergence mm. of life. And yeah. it, it got me onto this hypothesis that that somehow awe is a life detector. You know, anytime there's elements, evidence of life, you're like, wow, it's emerging. And it is vast and, and mysterious how what life is. But yeah, childbirth is a serious one. And I love the stories we gathered because people would say like this, I think it's this woman from Japan, like the minute I had a child, I thought about all the generations I'm part of. And now I'm the new generation. Mm -hmm. And I think about my parents and grandparents, right? This intergenerational vastness. Uh, so people, you know, it's it's a, a, an amazing experience. When my daughter Natalie was born, she 
came out of my wife's womb. And, and uh, the first thing that was funny, she had this little dark hair, which all babies tend to have. And I have blonde hair and my wife is blonde. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm not the dad, you know, and then I got over that quickly. But uh, I looked at her face, Scott. Yeah. I still can remember this to this day. And her face, I could just, because I study the human face, it had all the features of uncles and aunts and grandmothers put into this genetic miracle. And I was like, wow, you know, this is what reproduction is, is mm -hmm. taking all of our family members, mixing it up and bringing a life into the world. So it was, it was mind blowing. Incredible. You know? And it's cool because it, now there are movements yeah. like I profile in the book, like mm -hmm. mindful birthing, where you really, you don't, you get techniques to figure out the pain and then you focus on the wonder of life and bringing it into the world. Oh, I love that. I, I didn't know that was a, like a thing. Yeah. But uh, primarily probably in California. But We it, are it a little like susceptible to this kind of thing. It sounds very California, but I love it. I love it. Um, what about like creativity? Do you, what does the research show in the connection between all and creativity? It's good. And, and, you know, when people ask me like, well, God, oh, what do you mean? Like, is that good for you? Because I have an image of like encountering a judgmental God. And that's not what I, <laughs> I don't know if that'd be good for me, but awe is good for your body. It's good for your, your stress and it's good for your mind. And, you know, we have done work and, um, that shows you know, that a little bit of awe makes you more creative on classic creativity tasks, like the remote associations task or thinking of novel associations or relations between objects. It's related to um, more curiosity for kids in school, which I think is important. Um, it's related to, you know, there's mounting work that you're, you're sharper in your reasoning, right? You you mm. analyze evidence a little bit more carefully. That's work by Lonnie Shioda. You're better at science uh, and scientific reasoning. So I, you know, and and a, a tangentially related finding is you may, you're less polarized in looking at conflicts. It's not the us-them stereotype. It's like, well, this is a complicated issue, right? So I, you know, and you would have guessed this, obviously, but, you know, we needed to do the work. Like, a little dose of awe is good news for your curiosity and creativity. And I think most people feel that. They know, like, man, when I feel awe, I, a little burst of awe, and suddenly I come up, I go walking in the, the garden or the forest, and I get a new idea about my work, you know? So yeah. uh, it's, good, it's good news, yeah. Good fodder for inspiration. Yeah, as you know, there's, um, there's this table of character strengths, uses, and ex excesses. Every single character strength has the excesses category. Is there a dark side to all of too much all? Like well, the whole book is like basically an, an one big endorsement for all. Yeah. But is but 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 is there anything you can say critical at all? You know about this thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, most definitely, and the dark side of all um, is is really interesting if you, you know one uh source of it is if you build um threat into the experience of awe right mm. so let's say your experience of awe in a religious context has this threatening structure to it or judgmental god uh or you know a charismatic a coercive leader who is really threatening but awe-inspiring that will have the it won't have the benefits that we've talked about and will mm. close your mind more and make you feel stressed. So that's one, you know, Pierre Carlo de Valdesolo had cool data showing awe can make you see patterns that aren't there, right? It's just a pattern making emotion. Apopenia. Is that seeing patterns that aren't there? Mm. Wow. Yeah. That's over, cool. over. Yeah. 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 That's, that's cool. the technical, technical. Term. Um, yeah. And you know, when you think about, I'm writing it down. When you think about people yeah. who endorse QAnon or conspiracy theories or, you know, it's worrisome that, that this awe can do that. Um, you know, the dark side of awe for us as individuals, like you nicely said, like, man, if you're out on that end of the awe continuum mm. and you're feeling it all the time, you're probably bordering on mania, you know, mm. um, too expansive, too, everything's too vast, 
So I'd watch out for that. And then I think people have written about the political abuses of awe, that the Trump rallies, you know, stirring up this collective effervescence are uh, worrisome. And so, you know, you can you can get people revved up on just moving in synchrony and, you know, getting exhilarated about an idea and it, it can it can lead to problems. So I think there are huge dark sides to awe. Cool. Thank you for, for addressing that. How can people train themselves to find more awe in their daily lives? Yeah, you know, you know, this this is both a you know, thinking about this, um, and there are hints at practices in the book, you know. Um, and also when you think about the experiments that have been run. Um, but it's interesting to me because I believe that uh, there is an awe mindset that is like mine, yeah. that is a, has the same power as a mindfulness mindset. So mindfulness right. is the non-judgmental awareness of the contents of my mind and my context, right? Mm. I'm just over aware of things. Awe's mindset is I feel in a, an open way to be in relation to something vast. Right. I'm part mm. of something vast. And that's the mindset to cultivate with awe. Like, how am I part of this ecosystem? How do my emotions fit this Bach cello can, you know, piece? Um, mm. how does my dream life fit this painting by Kandinsky or uh mm. or and how am I part of this mass of people who are dancing at a concert? Um awe's mindset is being in relation to what's vast. And you can cultivate that. You know, you we did an awe walk study where people just go out and walk and we asked them to like think about vast things that you're related to and it helped their physical pain. So so part of wow. cultivating is the mindset and part is just to find those domains that give it to you, you know, and just pause and listen to music for awe. Think about it, somebody who's inspired you morally, you know move with other people, get out in nature. It's actually pretty easy to cultivate. Uh, and I, <laughs> there's a lot of work now. People are really realizing this. Like, as an example, I was doing a workshop on awe, and this guy who runs the grief programs uh, at Kaiser Permanente, we have this exercise. One way to feel awe is to tell an awe story. You know, oh, I, I was out you know, backpacking, I saw this electrical storm, I almost got hit, it was amazing. And so with people who are grieving, he has them tell awe stories about mm. the people they've lost, right? Which in some sense is what my book is. It's an awe story about my brother. And and that mm. is a very simple thing to do in one of life's most challenging moments that's, that's good for us. Yeah, I mean, you do make clear that even a couple minutes a day um, can really influence your whole life yeah at least influence the rest of the day yeah um I'm, I'm just thinking about linkages between this and james pennebaker's great work on uh, uh motion pro emotional processing of trauma uh through journaling could we have an all workbook and i don't mean like a workbook, an all notebook could we have an all notebook where even just writing down some of the most all like experiences before you go to bed uh yeah. maybe influences your next day yeah, I think that's coming. You know, we have some awe practices at Greater Good, uh, mm -hmm. and there are wonder books now, very much in the spirit, and awe books, mm. I think they're coming, you know, to, and I love your idea, so nuanced of, before you go to bed, write a, a story of awe, mm. right? Uh, yeah. At a heart, I do this when I was teaching healthcare providers during the pandemic, I taught thousands of mm. people uh, remotely, I would have them tell awe stories about their work. Right, like beautiful, what, yeah, and they were just like, it's the hardest time in their careers, but there was a lot of reverential content. Beautiful. How can all be an antidote to social polarization? Um, can it can it help with p different political persuasions uh, get along? Yeah, you know Daniel Stancato and I. He, you know, we did that paper, and you know, mm. you find. There are classic ways to measure polarization. Do I mm. think, you know, that disputes over police brutality or woke education or 
gender identity or incarceration, are they polarized? Do they have just adversarial enemies on each side? And that's Mm -hmm. it. And in a, a lot of people, we have become more polarized. It's a big problem in the political sphere. And but awe reduces the tendency to polarize. And you we've little experiences of awe in nature, and then you judge the adversaries in pol- in ideological disputes, and you think they're they have more common ground, right? They're not fanatical enemies. I think that's you know, I, I love your question because it just points to ways in which we can shift the discourse of our times and move away from this like you know, uh, Trump versus, you know, Bernie or whatever, and and move a little bit more toward kind of what are the the common grounds in different ideological persuasions? Where can we make progress? So uh, thanks for asking. It was a paper I'm proud of. Of course, all this stuff is related to each other, like your idea of collective effervescence, you know, moving in unison and ritual, dance, religion. I mean, when you go to these political rallies, you look at the Trump political rallies, there, yeah. there, there's collective effervescence there, you know, but yeah. it's not necessarily one that's, again, there's a dark side to all, right? Like, it's not like a collective effervescence necessarily leads you to uh, love your outgroup. Yeah, no, not at all. And you, you, and in fact, it's probably the opposite. And there's a little bit of work on that, mm. Uh, mm. that collective movement can lead us to polarized groups. You know, when you, like I remember reading about the massacres in Rwanda and the Hutus, it was so much collective stuff like dance and chanting and drugs and, you know, weaponry and, and just moving through villages. And I think that the collective effervescence of it uh, just unleashed the violence of that hmm. in, in some exponential way. So yeah, you know, uh, our task is to, rely on reason to make sense of whether these emotions are benefiting the greater good and mm, yeah. and to do it on a podcast like this. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> oh boy. How is all cumulative? Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, that's one of the deeper questions about these self-transcendent emotions more generally, compassion, gratitude, bliss is people have this sense There's a little bit of work on this in gratitude work. And then we have one study on awe. You know, when you have an awe experience, like you, you know, you go to a concert with friends or you go to a political march and you feel transformed or you go backpacking, you come out of it. And for the next week, you're like, God, I'm feeling like things are different. You know, I feel different about my life. And that suggests that that experience is cumulative. It builds on itself in some interesting way. We have one study that shows, indeed, the more we practice awe once a week, the greater the awe with the practice. How is, you know, which I see you smiling, like, that's the question. And I think part of it is like, you notice more awe, right? Like, oh, Mm. after backpacking, God, I'm looking at the sky a little bit more. You are reflecting on bigger systems that you're part of. You go to a political rally and you're moved by Bernie Sanders and suddenly you're like, wow, I should be thinking about how this tax critique applies to education or, or prison system. So, so it has this, it builds, but we just don't know much mm-hmm. about it. And I think it's one of the greatest questions in the field. The field of psychedelics, this is one of the big questions is, you know, people feel like it changes them for a long time. How? You know, and, and we'll oh. hopefully figure out. I, I, yeah, I can't wait <laughs> to know the answer to this. All right, well, let's end this interview uh, talking about this last chapter of your book, which is so interesting. It's on the fundamental unifying purpose of all. Yeah. Uh, let's bring all these threads together today and yeah. uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, that was a hard one to really, to write, like what's all really about. Um, mm. And I think that there are two answers. One we've touched upon is, um, you know, that all folds us into collectives and mm. ton of data on that thesis. Um, and that makes sense since in, you know, you nicely asked about new evolutionary approaches to the human mm. psyche. And, and it is this group selection. I got to be part of a collective and all does that uh, in a lot of different ways in terms of action and feeling and self-representation. But I, you know, I was really interested in the kind of the phenomenological coherence to awe. What is it about? And it really 
I, I, st- I, I was searching for it. And, you know, what does encountering somebody who moves you morally do to you or feeling uh, being out of nature? And, and the thing that it does is, in my view, is it really uh, makes you realize the systems that you're part of. And you shift out of this very narrow self-focus of specific actions within a context and you go deeper and, and it reveals that life is made up of all these systems, right? The system, mm. a social system of your neighborhood, a, a system of ideas in a discipline, systems of sounds like you hinted at in music and awe reveals that to you and then invites you to be part of those systems. And what's interesting about that to me, Scott, is, you know, you and I have thought a lot about meaning, like young people finding meaning, you and I finding meaning, finding meaning after your brother dies. Mm -hmm. And meaning, in some sense, is about locating your individual identity in broad systems. Is it a spiritual Mm -hmm. system that really gives you strength or a sense that you're part of nature or a social movement? And that's that is the core of all. Um, And it took, you know some investigation to get there uh but i think it's a big deal i think that um to like we've talked about young people they aren't thinking quite as much about these broad systems they can be part of Mm. um and awe is a a very important pathway to that realization beautiful i love it and i love i love how just how far one so one one construct can take us i mean we're it all pivoted around all today and we're, we're talking about large scale social dynamics and systems and fundamentally remapping society. <laughs> I, mean, I, love it. <laughs> I love it. Not every construct can do that in psychology, right? Yeah, Not every construct, one, you know, so yeah. All is a good one. All is a good one. Yeah. Um, Dr. Keltner, um, thank you so much for the chat today and um, I wish you all the best in the rest of your book tour. Yeah. Thanks Scott. It's always good to be with you. Likewise. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.